and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Emery Hedeman, a senior editor for KFF Health News and the regular editor on this podcast. I'm filling in for Julie this week, joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington. We're taping on Thursday, September 19th at 10 a.m. As always, news happens fast, and things might have changed by the time you hear this. So, here we go. We're joined today by video conference by Tammy Luby of CNN. Good morning. Shalfali Luthra of the 19th. Hello. And Joanne Kennan of Politico and Johns Hopkins University Schools of Nursing and Public Health. Hi, everybody. No interview this week, so let's get right to the news, shall we? It's big. It's popular. And if Donald Trump reclaims the presidency, it could be on the chopping block again. Yes, I'm talking, of course, about the Affordable Care Act. Over the weekend, Senator J.D. Vance claimed that Trump had, quote, protected Americans insured under the ACA from, quote, losing their health coverage. Trump himself made a similar claim during the recent debate, where he also said he has the, quote, concepts of a plan for health reform. Vance, who is Trump's running mate, suggested the GOP could loosen regulations to make cheaper policies available. But otherwise, the Trump campaign has not said much about what his administration might change. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris has backed off her own plan to change the ACA. You may remember that um, when she was running for president in 2019, Harris embraced a Medicare for All plan. Now, Harris says she plans to build on the existing health system rather than replace it. So let's talk about what Trump might do as president. What sort of changes could Trump implement to make policies cheaper, as Vance has suggested? Well, one of the things that Vance has talked about when he talks about deregulating the market, giving people more choice of plans, it's actually separating people, the healthier people and the sicker enrollees, into separate different risk pools, which is what existed before the ACA. And that may be actually better for the healthy people that might lower their premiums, but it would cause a lot of problems for sicker enrollees, those with chronic health conditions or, you know, serious illnesses because they would see their premiums skyrocket. And this is one of the reasons why healthcare was so unaffordable for many people prior to the ACA. So Vance says that he wants to protect people with pre-existing conditions. That's what everyone says. It's a very popular and well-known provision of the ACA. But by separating people into different risk pools, it would actually hurt people with pre-existing conditions because it may make their health insurance unaffordable. The difference between pre-ACA and post-ACA is it might actually even it would be as bad or possibly worse for people with pre-existing conditions. Right now, everybody's in one unified risk pool, right? Whether you're sick or healthy, your costs more or less get averaged out, and that's how premiums are calculated. Before ACA, people with pre-existing conditions just couldn't get covered necessarily, or if they got covered, it was sky high, the premiums. By doing what Tammy just described, the people presumably in the riskiest pool, the sickest people, the insurers would have to offer them coverage. They couldn't say, no, you're sick, you can't have it because there's guaranteed coverage, but it would be sky high. So it would be de facto no insurance for most of those people, unless the government were to subsidize them to a you know really high extent, which I didn't hear J.D. Vance mention the other day. <laughs> right. so. And one of the other things that they talked about more choice, I mean, one of the issues that a lot of people complained about in the ACA early on was that they didn't want substance abuse coverage. You know, there's 10 health essential benefits, which Every insurer has to cover, you know, pregnancy, uh, you know, maternal care, et cetera. And 60 year old men or even 60 year old women said, you know, why am I paying for this? This is making my plan more expensive. But again, as Joanne said, it's evening out the costs among everyone so that it's making health care more affordable for everyone. And if you allow people to start picking and choosing what benefits they want covered, It's going to make the plans more expensive for those who need the higher cost care. Tammy alluded to something that is really important, which is that these conditions we're talking about are very common. A lot of people get pregnant. For example, a lot of people have chronic health conditions. We are not the healthiest country in the world. And so when you think about who would be affected by this, it's quite a large number of Americans who would no longer be able to get affordable health coverage. And a small group of people who probably would because, I mean, one thing that's worth noting, right, is even if you are healthy for a time, that that's a transient state and you can be healthy when you are young and get older and suddenly have any problems and then things look very different. It seems like if they used the exact words pre-existing condition protections and said they were trying to roll them back in order to make policies cheaper, that might be just a bad political move all around. Pre-existing condition protections are pretty popular, right? Yes, they certainly are. But that's why they're saying they're going to continue it. But what's also popular is choice. 
And that's been one of the knocks against the Affordable Care Act is that while there are a lot of plans out there, they do have to conform to certain requirements. And therefore, that gives people less choice. I mean, and remember, one of the things that we you, we started by talking about what a second Trump administration might look like for health care. One of the things the first Trump administration did is loosen the rules on short term plans, which don't have to conform to the ACA. And prior, uh, you know, they were available for a sh- short time as a bridge between policies. But the uh, Trump administration lengthened them to up to three years. And the goal of the Trump administration was that people would have more choice. They could pick skinnier plans that they felt would cover them, but they didn't always realize that if they got into a car accident, if they were diagnosed with cancer, if you know something bad happened, they did not have all of the protections that ACA plans have. Joanne, you have something to add. So the first thing is that they spent years and a lot of political capital trying and failing to repeal the ACA or to make major changes in the ACA. The reason it failed is because even then when the ACA was sort of quasi-popular, not you know, there was a lot of controversy still, the pre-existing condition part was extremely popular. Since then, the ACA has become even more popular. Uh, what Obama said when he was speaking to the Democratic Republic, uh, Democratic National Committee convention the other night, he, remember that aside where he said, hey, they don't call it Obamacare anymore now that it's popular. It is popular. You've even had Republican senators going on record saying, you know, it's here to stay. So major overhaul of it is politically not going to be popular. Plus, the Republicans, even if they capture the Senate, which is what most of the prognosticators are saying right now, it would be a small majority if the Republicans have 51, 52. What we, none of us know exactly what's going to happen because we're in a rather rapidly changing political environment. But say the Republicans capture the Senate and say Trump is in the White House, they're not going to have 60 votes. They're not going to have anywhere near 60 votes. I'm not even sure if there was a way to do this under reconciliation, which would require 51. I'm not sure they have 51 votes. So and then if they do it through some kind of regulatory approach, which I think is harder to do with something this massive, but people find a way, then it ends up in court. So I think it's politically unfeasible and I think it's practically unfeasible. I think there are smaller things they could do to weaken it. There's also, I mean, they did last time and, and coverage dropped under Trump last time. I mean, they could not promote it. They could not market it. They could not have navigators helping people. There's lots of things they could do to shrink it and damage it. Or, but there's a difference between denting something and having a frontal collision. And we've all seen Vance have to roll back other things that he's predicted Trump would do. So this is very TBD. One of the bigger issues with the ACA going into next year is these enhanced subsidies that Joe Biden implemented under the pandemic that helped a lot of people pay for their premiums will expire at the end of 2025. And depending on which party has control after this election, that could decide the fate of the subsidies. Joanne, you had something to add on this. That's the big vulnerability. I mean, it's not so much the, are they going to repeal it or define their concept of a plan? I mean, the, the subsidies are vulnerable because they expire without action. And they're part of a larger debate that's going to happen no matter who wins the presidency and no matter who wins Congress. Is that the, a lot of the tax cuts expire in 2025. The subsidies are part of that tax, but many aspects of the tax bill are going to be a huge issue no matter who's in charge. The subsidies are vulnerable, right? Republicans think that they went too high. Basically, those subsidies let more middle class people with, with a higher income get ACA subsidies, so for insurance is more affordable. And quite a few million people, Tammy might remember how many, because I don't, are getting subsidized this way. It's not free. They don't get the biggest subsidies as somebody who's lower income, but they are getting enough subsidies that we've saw ACA enrollment go up. That is where the big political battle over the ACA is inevitable. I mean, that is going to happen no matter what else happens around aspects of repealing or, or redesigning or or anything else. This is inevitable. They expire unless there's action. There will be a fight. Yeah. The, these, and I don't know how it'll turn out. Right. These subsidies were created as part of the American Rescue Plan in 2021 and were extended for two years as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, which the Republicans don't like. And they have, as Joanne said, they've allowed more middle class people to come in. And they've also they're more generous subsidies than in the past. Plus, they've made policies free for a lot of lower income people. Folks can get these policies without premiums. So enrollment has skyrocketed in large part because of these subsidies. Now there are more than 20 million people enrolled. It's a record. So the Biden administration would like to keep that intact, especially if Harris wins the presidency. But it will be a big fight in Congress next year as part of the overall Tax Cuts and Jobs Act negotiations. And, you know, we'll see what the Democrats might have to give up in order to retain the subsidies. 
the it's enhanced be, yeah. subsidies. There are deals to be had with tax cuts versus subsidies because these are large, sprawling bills with many moving parts. But it's way too early to know, you know, if Republicans are willing to deal on this and what a deal would look like. We're, we're nowhere near there. But yeah, if you talk about ACA battles in 2025, that's number one. Well, speaking of health policies that are on the GOP agenda, some high-ranking Republican lawmakers are saying they want to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act if the party wins big in November, particularly the part that enables Medicare drug negotiations. You may recall their objections from when Congress passed the law two years ago. Republicans argue the negotiations harm innovation and amount to government price controls. But on the other hand, drug prices are an issue where Trump kind of sort of agrees with Democrats. He has promised to, quote, take on big pharma. Does this mean we could see a Republican Congress fighting with Trump over drug price negotiations? Well, he did have a lot of executive orders and a lot of efforts that were very un-Republican, like one was called Most Favored Nation. He didn't say that we should do negotiations. We were just going to piggyback on the negotiations done in other countries and get their lower prices. He didn't really get very far in a lot of those measures, so it didn't come to a fight with the Republican Congress. But he may leave the negotiation process alone. The next set of drugs, it'll be 15 drugs that we'll find out next year that will be negotiated. So he could leave that alone. If he tries to expand it, yeah, he may have some problems with the Republican Congress. But as we've also seen, the a Republican Congress has acquiesced to his demands in the past. And Congress certainly has no shortage of battles teed up for 2025, of course. Uh, Speaking of, here we are again. Yesterday in the House of Representatives, Democrats and Republicans joined together to defeat a stopgap spending bill that would have kept the government open. To be sure, they didn't have the same objections. Democrats opposed a Republican amendment that would impose new voter registration requirements about proving citizenship. And hard right Republicans objected to the size of the temporary spending bill, $1.6 trillion. Trump weighed in on social media, calling on Republicans to oppose any government spending bill at all unless it comes with a citizenship measure. Now, Senate Republican leaders in particular are not thrilled about this. Here are the words of Mitch McConnell, who said it better than I can. Quote, it would be politically beyond stupid for us to do that right before the election, because certainly we'd get the blame for that government shutdown. What happens now? Last minute agreement. <laughs> like I, feel, I used to cover the Hill full, full time. I no longer do. But it was like late night standing in the hallway for a last minute reprieve. At some point, they're going to probably keep the government open. But with Trump's demands and the citizenship proof of a life for voters and all that, it's going to be really messy. You know, Mike Johnson became speaker after a whole bunch of other speakers failed to keep the government open. That's appropriations right. bill. That we went through chaos. He has a small majority. He survived because the Democrats intervened on his behalf once because of Ukraine. We have no idea the dynamics. Of, do the Democrats want to see complete chaos so the Republicans get blamed? Who knows? I don't think it's going to be a handshake tomorrow and let's do a deal. What they usually do is continue current spending levels and what they call a continuing resolution. So you keep status quo for, you know, one month, two months, three months, you know, sometimes 10 months. The odds are the government will stay open at some kind of a last minute patchwork deal that nobody particularly likes. But that's likely I wouldn't say that certain Republicans have backed off shutting the government down for a while now couple of years. It's worth noting, though, that even this bill that they just voted down would have only kicked the can down to March. So we are still talking about something that the new Congress would have to deal with pretty quickly, even if we can get something done short term. But we've got a lot of news today. So moving on to reproductive health news. This week, Senate Republicans again blocked a bill that would have guaranteed access to in vitro fertilization nationwide. That federal bill would, of course, have overridden state laws that restrict access to the procedure. You may recall that Republicans also blocked that bill earlier this summer, describing it as a political show vote. And indeed, Democrats are trying to get Republicans on the record opposing IVF in order to draw a contrast with the GOP before voters go to the polls. What do we think? Did Democrats succeed here in showing voters their lawmakers really think about IVF? I mean, realistically, yes. I think this is a very effective strategy for Democrats. If they could talk about abortion and IVF every day, all day, they would. We can look at Taylor Swift's endorsement of Kamala Harris and Tim Walz. She specifically mentions reproductive rights. And she mentions IVF in particular, noting that she thinks that these are the candidates who will support access to, to that fertility regimen. IVF is very popular and it is obviously going to be a major battle because it is this next frontier for the anti-abortion movement. And the Republican Party is allied very closely to this movement, even if there have been more fractures emerging lately. 
I just don't see how Republicans can find a way to make this a, a political winner for them unless they figure out a way to to change their their tune, at least temporarily, without alienating that ally they have. Absolutely. And meanwhile, speaking of the consequences of these actions on abortion lately, this week we learned of the first publicly reported death from delayed care under a state abortion ban. ProPublica reported the heart-wrenching story of a 28-year-old mother in Georgia who died in 2022 after her doctors held off on performing a DNC. Performing a DNC in Georgia is a felony, with a few exceptions. Sorry, this is difficult to talk about, especially if you or someone you know has needed a DNC, and that may be a lot of us, whether we know it or not. Her name was Amber Thurman. Amber needed the DNC because she was suffering from a rare complication after taking the abortion pill. She developed a serious infection, and she died on the operating table. Georgia's Maternal Mortality Review Committee determined that Amber Thurman's death was preventable. ProPublica says at least one other woman has died from being unable to access illegal abortions and timely medical care. And as the story said, quote, there are almost certainly others. On Tuesday, Vice President Harris said Amber's death shows the consequences of Trump's actions to block abortion access. How does this affect the national conversation about abortion? Does it change anything? I mean, it should, and I, I don't think it's that simple. And it's it's tough because, I mean, these stories are incredible pieces of journalism, and what they show us are that two women are dead because of abortion bans, and that there are almost certainly many more because these deaths were in 2022, very soon after the Dobbs decision. And what has been really striking at the same time is that The anti-abortion movement has very clear talking points on these deaths, and they are doing what we have seen them do in so many cases where women have almost lost their lives, and now in this case where they have, which is they blame the doctors. And they have been going out of their way to argue that actually the exceptions that exist in these laws are very clear, even though doctor after doctor will tell you they are not. And that it is the doctor's fault for not providing care when there is very obviously an exception. They are also arguing that this is further proof that medication abortion, which is responsible for the vast majority of abortions in this country, is unsafe. Even though, as you noted, and as these stories noted, the complications these women experienced are very rare and could be addressed and, and treated for and do not have to be fatal if you have access to healthcare and doctors who are not handcuffed by your state's abortion laws. And so what, what I think happens then is this is something that that should matter and that should change our conversation. And there is this, there are people talking about this and making clear that this is because of the reproductive health world that we live in. But I don't think it will necessarily change the course of where we are headed despite the fact that what abortion opponents are saying is is not true, and despite the fact that these abortion bans remain very unpopular. I think you can, you know, she said it really well, but I think in terms of does it change minds, think about the two bumper stickers, right? One is abortion bans kill, and the other one is the abortion pill kills. And it's really, both of these women did take the, had medication abortions. Those side effects are very, very, very unusual. That, that dangerous side effects are extremely unusual. There's years of data. There's like no drug on earth that is 100%, 1,000%, 100,000% safe. So these were tragedies in which the women did develop severe life-threatening side effects, didn't get the proper treatment. But think about your, 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 your bumper stickers. I don't think this changes a lot of minds. All right. Well, unfortunately, we will keep watching for this and more news on this subject. But in state news... Nevada will become the 18th state to use its Medicaid funds to cover abortions after a recent court ruling. While federal funds are generally barred from paying for abortions, states do have more flexibility to use their own Medicaid funds to cover the procedure. And North Dakota's abortion ban has been overturned after a judge ruled that the state's constitution protects a woman's right to an abortion until the fetus is viable. But there's a bigger challenge. The state has no abortion clinics left. We've talked a lot on this podcast about how overturning Roe has effectively created new, largely geographical classes of haves and have-nots, people who can access abortion care and people who can't. It seems like the lesson out of North Dakota right now is that evening that playing field isn't as simple as changing the law, yes? Absolutely. And this is something that 
we have seen even before Roe was overturned. I mean, a, an example that I think about a lot is Texas, which had had this very big abortion law passed in 2013, and it was litigated in the courts, was in and out of effect before it went to the Supreme Court and was largely struck down. But clinics closed in the meantime. And what that tells us is that when clinics close, they largely don't reopen. It is very, very hard to open an abortion clinic. It is expensive. It can be dangerous because of harassment. You need to find providers. You need to build up a medical infrastructure that doesn't exist. And we are seeing several states with ballot measures to try to undo abortion bans in their states. Uh, Florida, Missouri, Nebraska with their 12-week ban. We are seeing efforts across the country to try and restore access to these states. But the question is exactly what you pointed out, which is there is a right in name and there is a right in practice. And for all the difficulties of creating a right in name, creating a right in practice is even harder. And there is just so much more that we will need to be following as, as journalists and also as people who consume healthcare to fully see what it takes for people to be able to get reproductive health care, including abortion, after they have lost it. All right. And with fewer than 50 days left until Election Day and way fewer before early voting begins, a court in Nebraska has ruled that competing abortion rights measures can appear on the ballot there this fall. Two measures, one that would expand access and one that would restrict it, qualified for the ballot. Nebraska will be the first state to ask residents to vote on two opposing abortion ballot measures. Currently, the state bans abortion in most cases, starting at 12 weeks. There are at least nine other states with ballot measures to protect abortion rights this fall, but this one's pretty unusual. What do we think? Will this be confusing to Nebraska voters? I mean, I imagine if I were a voter, I would be confused. Most people don't follow the ins and outs of what's on their ballot until you get close to election day and you are bombarded with advertisements. And I think this is really striking because it is just part of, as part of a I guess maybe not long because this only happened two years ago, but part of a repeated pattern of abortion opponents trying to find different ways to get around the fact that ballot measures restoring abortion rights or protecting abortion rights largely win. And so how do you find a way around that? You can try and create confusion. You can try and raise the threshold for approval like they tried and failed to do in Ohio. You can, maybe in Nebraska, this is more effective, um, put multiple measures on the ballot. You can try, as they tried and failed to do in Missouri, try and stop something from appearing on the ma on the ballot. And I think this is just something that we need to watch and see. Is this the thing that finally sticks? Does this finally undercut efforts to use direct voting to restore abortion rights, which we should also note is a strategy with an expiration date of sorts because not every state allows for this direct democracy approach. And we're actually hitting the end of the list of states very soon where this is a viable strategy. And as we know, every state where a ballot measure has addressed this issue since Roe was overturned has fallen on the side of abortion rights, ultimately. It'll be curious to see what happens here where voters have both choices right before them. Well, let's wrap up with tech news this week. Are you wearing an Apple Watch right now? Or maybe you're listening to us on AirPods? Well, that watch could soon tell you if you might have sleep apnea. Or if you have trouble hearing, those earbuds could soon help you hear better. The FDA has given separate green lights to two new Apple product functions. One is an Apple Watch change that assesses the wearer's risk of sleep apnea. And the FDA also authorized Apple AirPods as the first over-the-counter hearing aid software to assist those with mild to moderate hearing loss. Hearing aids can be pretty expensive, and some resist wearing them due to stigma or stubbornness. What does this mean for people with these conditions and also about the possibilities for health tech? I mean, none of us are covering the FDA's tech division full time, so or even much at all. So basically, there's been a trend toward sort of overlap with consumer and health products. Many of us have something on our wrist or something in our phone that is monitoring something or other. Um, and there's been some controversy about how accurate some of them are. My understanding with the sleep apnea thing that it doesn't actually diagnose it. It it, it tracks your sleep patterns, and, it, and if it sees some red flags, it says, you might have sleep apnea, you should go see a doctor. That's what I think that does. That's right. It is arguably useful to know, you know, you're asleep when you're having sleep apnea. You don't necessarily know what's happening. So it's arguably a useful thing that you have some kind of an alert system. The hearing aids, it's not just these. There have been a, the FDA a few months ago authorized more over-the-counter hearing aids of various types, which have made them much cheaper and much more accessible. This is an advanced, another category, another type to have people are wearing earbuds anyway. I know people who have the over-the-counter hearing aids and they are small and cheap. So that industry has really been disrupted by tech. So we are seeing not necessarily some of the 
sky in the pie promises of health and tech from a few years ago, but some useful things for consumers to either make things more accessible or affordable like the earbuds, although I would lose them, or just, you know, a useful tool or a potentially useful tool. I don't know how great the data is. Um, you know, saying, you know, ask your doctor about this. Sleep apnea is is dangerous. So, you know, my mom is about to turn 90 and we have um, a fall monitor on her watch that we actually pay for an extra service that they, you know, alert an emergency. They, I was with her once when she fell. You called her and said, are you okay? And, um, and she said, yes, and my daughter's here and et cetera. And except at 90, she still plays ping pong in this ping pong, doubles ping pong, not a lot of movement for 90 year olds. And it does get the fall monitor very confused. <laughs> I think it's been trained. So, yeah, I mean, it's not that expensive and it's great peace of mind. People would much rather have it on their watch because young, cool people wear a watch, you know, smart watches than, you know, those buttons around their neck. I would have never gotten my mother to wear a button around her neck. So it's part of a larger trend of, of tech becoming a health tool. And it's not a panacea, but the affordability for over-the-counter ear hearing aids is a big deal. Right, right. This is expanded access. If you've got this consumer product already in your pocket, on your wrist, in your ears, uh, why not have it help with your health? We've already kind of adjusted in many ways to health tech. We had Fitbits. We've had things that have tracked our, our heart rates and that sort of thing, or even our, our phones can do that at this point. But hearing aids, are they come in many cases for people who have mild or moderate hearing loss. They don't even go for a hearing aid because they don't want to be stigmatized as may, being maybe a little older and being unable to hear, even if you know they might just muddle through. But if you've already got those AirPods in because you're going to take a call later, I mean, that's, that's pretty un- below the radar. You don't have to feel too uh, self-conscious about yeah, that Yeah, my one, mom would so. look cool. <laughs> but she actually doesn't need them, so if, that's okay. Uh, if she's playing ping pong at her age, she already she looks cool. She plays ping pong very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm doing the equivalent when I'm ninety. I hope I'm ninety. You know, like so. Here, right, here. But, you know. <laughs> okay, that's this week's news. Now it's time for our extra credit segment. That's when we each recommend a story we read this week that we think you should read too. As always, don't worry if you miss it. We'll post the links on the podcast page at kffhealthnews.org and in our show notes on your phone or other mobile device. Shivali, why don't you go first this week? All right. My story is from KFF Health News by the great Rajana Pradhan. The headline is, At Catholic Hospitals, a mission of charity runs up against high care costs for patients. The story is one of my favorite genres of stories, which is stories about how Everyone loves their hospital, and their hospital is a business. And Rajna does a great job looking at the history of Catholic hospitals and the extent to which they were founded as these beacons of charitable care meant to improve the community. But actually, when you look at where Catholic hospitals are now, and Catholic hospitals have really proliferated in in the past, you know, several years, they look a lot like businesses and a lot less like charities. There's some fascinating you know, patient stories and also analyses in here showing that Catholic hospitals are less likely than other nonprofit hospitals to treat Medicaid patients. Um, they are great at going after patients for unpaid, med- unpaid medical bills, including suing them, garnishing wages, reporting them to credit bureaus. Um, it's really great. It's the exact kind of journalism that I think we need more of. And I love this story and I hope others do too. Excellent. It is a great piece of journalism. We hope everyone will take some time to read it. Tammy, why don't you go? Okay. My extra credit is an in-depth piece by one of our very own, Alice Miranda Olstein of Politico. And it's titled, Doctors are Leaving Conservative States to Perform a abortions, we followed one. So Alice followed a doctor who spent a month in Delaware learning how to perform abortions because she couldn't obtain that training in her home state across the country. Alice notes that Politico granted the doctor anonymity due to her fear of professional repercussions and the threat of physical violence for seeking abortion training, which is concerning to hear. While many stories have written about states' abortion bans, Alice's piece provides a different perspective. She writes about the lengths that doctors must go to to obtain training in the procedure and the negative effects that the overturning of Roe has had on medical education. Uh, The doctor she profiled spent nearly two years searching for a position where she could obtain this training before landing at Delaware's Planned Parenthood. Uh, It cost nearly $8,000. The doctor had to pull together grants and scholarships in order to cover the cost. Alice walked readers through the doctor's training in both surgical and medical abortions and through her ethical and medical thoughts after seeing, and this is one thing that stuck with me in the story, what's called the products of conception on a little tray. So the story is very moving and it's well worth your time. 
Absolutely. And the more detail we can get about what these sorts of procedures and this training looks like for doctors, the better we understand what we're actually talking about when we're talking about these abortion bans and other restrictions on reproductive health. Joanne, why don't you talk to us about your extra credit this week? Okay. There's a piece in the New York Times by Teddy Rosenbluth called, This Chat Box Pulls People Away from Conspiracy Theories. And there's also a related um, podcast at The Atlantic called by uh, Jerusalem Demsas, When Fact Check backfires. They're both about the same piece of research that appeared in science. Basically, debunking or fact-checking has not really worked very well in pulling people away from misinformation and conspiracy theories. There had been some research suggesting that if you try to debunk something, you actually, it was the backfire effect that you you actually made it stick more. That doesn't always happen. There's sort of some people that it does and some people it doesn't, that's beginning to be understood more. And what this study the Times reported on and the Atlantic podcast discussed is using AI, because we all think that AI is going to be generating more disinformation, but AI is also going to be fighting disinformation. And this is an example of it, where the people in the study had a dialogue, a written typed in dialogue with a chatbot that gave a bespoke response to conspiracy beliefs, including vaccines and other public health things. And that these individually tailored back and forth dialogue with an AI bot actually made about 20% of the people, which is in this field a lot, drop their or modify their beliefs or drop their conspiracy beliefs and that it stuck. It wasn't just because some of these fact checks work for like a week or two. These they checked in with people two months later and the changes in their thinking had had stuck. So it's it's not a solution to disinformation and conspiracy belief, but it is a fairly significant arrow to a more to new techniques and more research to how to debunk it better without a backfire effect. That's great. Thanks for sharing those. All right. My extra credit this week comes from two of our podcast pals at The Washington Post, Lauren Weber and Rachel Rubine. The headline is, What Warning Labels Could Look Like on Your Favorite Foods? They report that the FDA is considering labeling food to identify when they have a high saturated fat content, sodium, sugar, those sorts of things that we should all be paying attention to on nutrition labels. But their proposal falls short, critics say. It's not quite as good, they say, at identifying the health risk factors of certain amounts of sodium and sugar in our in our um, food, especially compared to other uh, countries. They do an extensive study on chilies, food labeling, in fact. And if you're like me and you buy a lot of your groceries for your household and you try to look at the nutrition labels, you might be surprised by some of the items the article identifies as being particularly high in sodium, like Cheerios. Bad news for my family this morning. All right, that's our show for this week. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'd appreciate it if you left a review. That helps other people find us too. Special thanks, as always, to our amazing engineer, Francis Ying. And as always, you can email us your comments or questions. We're at whatthehealth at kff.org. Or you could try tweeting me. I'm lurking on X at Emory DC. Shafali? I'm at Shafali L. Joanne. At Joanne Cannon on Twitter, at Joanne Cannon one on threads. And Tammy. Best place to find me is CNN.com. We'll be back in your feed next week. Until then, be healthy. Be healthy.